there were all of these different cool things that we could do with the technology and the consulting that we were selling. And so I was always just very focused on the end result. Ultimately, what metric are we going to move? Because at the end of the day, the data warehouse, the database administration, the application server, whatever, it's just a means to an end to get there. And so I've always just been more focused on talking to the people that are responsible for those particular metrics, learning more about them and what's important to them and resources that they have. Because I know there were times I'd call folks and they would try to blow me off. And like, you need to talk to our IT manager. And I'm like, no, I actually need to talk to you. Hey everybody, Jason here. Welcome to another special guest episode series here on the Authentic Persuasion Show. Uh, I'd like to start this just as a reminder, let everyone know the mission of, of the show and my mission is to help fill the world with authentic persuaders. And I'm so glad that you're here because if you're here, there's a reason, hopefully to get some value from my conversation with my special guest for this series and take that into your sales role, your leadership role, your business owner role, maybe in your professional education role, your role as a student, who knows? But one of the things I know is that everything in sale, in life is sales and, and everyone is in some kind of sales role. And so this will apply to literally everybody. So my special guest for this series is Deirdre Jones from the University of Toledo's Edward H. Smith School of Professional Sales. In her words, Deirdre uh, holds a MBA from the University of Toledo in Information Systems and a Bachelor's in Business Administration also from the University of Toledo in Marketing with a professional sales emphasis. She's trained over 1,100 students and 600 working professionals on sales, sales education. She conceived and runs the nation's first and only national sales competition dedicated exclusively to the non-senior the University of Toledo's Invitational Sales Competition. And I'm super excited to have her on the show, talk about sales. And of course, we're going to start with authenticity. Deirdre, welcome to the Authentic Persuasion Show. Yeah, welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. So with your background, with the bachelor's in uh, business administration, with marketing and sales focus, and then you have the, the MBA, uh, let's go back and what, talk about what led to this. What was your foray in sales prior to getting into higher ed? Yeah, so I think the first time, like a lot of folks, I did school fundraisers when I was little. It was like probably like the first time. One of the things my mom always taught me when I was little was it's really important to try to see things from other people's perspective. So even as a kid, I was thinking like, why would somebody want to buy the Girl Scout cookies? Is it just because the cookies are that good or what is it really about? And so it's always taking that step backwards. And then on my first time where I would try to get a little more hardcore, there was this um, program where I could sell wrapping paper and stuff like that door to door so I could earn um, different things. And the first um, commission, so to speak, was an alarm clock that I actually still have to this day um, because that's my reminder. That was probably like the first time I was ever really focused on. I have a goal. This is what I want. How am I going to get there? And then focusing on different things to try to help folks. But always been in sales in some way, shape, or form. Because like you said earlier, everyone is in sales in, in some way, shape, or form. So, but I know my journey from a professional perspective, it's evolved over time. At one point, I was like, I want to be an Olympic track star because I was really fast. Was, when I was younger, I was a good track athlete. But then I was just like, but that's, being a professional athlete, that's short-lived. And so then it evolved and morphed over time. And I went from wanting to be in broadcast journalism because I liked being in the know and helping people. And then I got injured, ironically, running track. And so then I was like, I'll be a physical therapist because I want to help people. And then I realized pharmacists were the most trusted profession. And so I'm like, I'm trustworthy. And then but, I was, but every time I just kept focusing on what is it that I'm trying to get accomplished to help folks. When I started to piece together on my journey, I was like, I'm competitive. I like helping people. I like being in the know. I like doing things that are, you know, proactive and actually solution oriented. And then literally the night, it was like the week before I was supposed to go to rocket launch for the honors college of pharmacy. I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> this isn't the right path. And then, so I talked to some advisors and they helped me figure out that I probably belong in business and not in pharmacy. And so once I got into college of business, really felt like I was in the right place. 
and spend some time doing more formal sales jobs in a retail, but also doing job shadowing in the professional world and realized that was where I needed to be. So I started off in business technology, consulting sales and services, selling improved productivity and HIPAA compliance and Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. And there I go date myself <laughs> when I started in that space and eventually came into higher education. I probably could trace that back to some things I had done actually in high school that helped me graduate a little bit faster with AP credits and things because I went through the honors program in three and a half instead of the traditional four or so and had a great um, honors um, advisor who said, you should get your master's and we'll pay for it. And, and so it gave me um, the opportunity to actually teach some classes. And I loved teaching the classes. I had great reviews. My students did awesome. And because I got to teach a sales class and also an IT class because of my background in IT and in professional selling and just loved it. And so I had the bug. And so when an opening came up, I was like, I think I'm going to actually leave the world of professional selling and come back into higher education so I can teach and stuff. And that's obviously evolved over time as well, too, from being a full-time um, instructor in the program to now just part-time instructor in the program, but full-time director of the programs. And obviously different increments in between times, but in a nutshell. <laughs> so one thing that came up in my mind as you were talking is I'm thinking that path, which I think is probably a more normal path that people take as far as trying to figure out what they want to do. I know it's very similar to, to what I did in life. Uh, what advice would you have for people who go through that, especially younger people, or maybe not even younger people who are still trying to figure out what they want to do? And then they're just going that route. And even the fact that you had the courage to pull the plug on the pharmacist thing, like the day before, which most people wouldn't necessarily do. Yeah, no, I think the biggest thing that I always try to encourage students and even like my own children is the, take that step back. What's the impact you want to have? What is the impact you want to have when this degree is done or when you're in this role? What are you looking to get accomplished? Because at the end of the day, there are so many different ways to scratch an itch. And because there's different ways you can help people. There's different ways you can improve the world. There's different ways. Basically, at the end of the day, you're increasing positives and or decreasing negatives. So what is it that you want to have from an impact perspective? And then use that solution mindset to figure out what sorts of roles you can be in and what sorts of organizations can you work in to accomplish those particular goals. and. So that would be like step number one. And then the other part of it is just come up with a basic plan. Basic plan, talk to people, do background research. Um, LinkedIn's a great place to take a look at people's virtual resumes, like what kind of degree did they have? Where did they go? What did their career um, projection and lattice look like? And then figure it out from there. Reach out to those people, ask questions, and then just execute a plan. Get out of your head and then just start doing because once you actually start taking the classes, at a university or maybe it's a training program because you're trying to retool or, or actually doing an internship or a co-op or an apprenticeship or some job shadowing, just do something so that you can actually experience it because it's the rest of your life is an awful long period of time to not feel like what you're doing matters or that it's, it's tapping into the things that are your strengths. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a lot of times you might get into a career because either you think it makes good money or it's going to be stable or it's going to be this or that, or you like doing this thing. And then that's different than what happens in the role. And if you're going to want to do that thing, whatever that is, day in and day out. I remember when I was in community college era, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I found commercial diving because I was really into scuba diving, commercial diving, like underwater, like welding and construction and which is the opposite of who I am anyway. But I was like, wow, you can make a lot of money. And I remember my dad saying, don't turn your hobby into your career because you'll no longer like that hobby. And I think sometimes that's okay advice. I think sometimes that's applicable. I think sure. for me, it would have just been a square peg in a round hole. But what do you like doing? And then what is it like when you actually do that job? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that happens to a lot of people in sales where it's like they have a friend who's making a lot of money and talking about how great sales is, <clears throat> not talking about all the challenges with sales. Yeah. And they think, great, I'm going to get into sales too because my friend is killing it. Yeah, but that's the highlights. Right. That's not everything to it. 
Yeah. There, and the thing is, there's pros and cons in everything and just recognizing. Mm-hmm. And I think probably the other big, biggest piece of advice, regardless of what someone wants to do, is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and figuring out how to navigate uncertainty. Because sometimes I think folks stick to the things that they feel super comfortable or confident in because of their experience or who they know. So many of the things that I've done in my career and that when you know, I've coached work with other people, I didn't necessarily know. You figure it out as you go along, right? If you're curious and you're willing to ask questions and take educated, calculated risks, go for it. Go for it. Because yes, you might fail, you might mess up, but failure is just first attempt in learning, mistakes, <laughs> fertilizer, right? However you want to label it, it's just part of the process. Completely agree. So going back to you in sales, and then we'll transition to talk about your students. So obviously your first forays into sales, you're crushing it, right? Because you're making commission, you got your alarm clock <laughs> and things are going great. Later on in life, you're getting into actual sales roles or, or dealing with that. What did you think sales was about? What did you think it involved? What was that, your experience of sales? Like, yeah. Let's say more professional sales. Right. There was a part of me that wasn't as mentally prepared for failure and the patient side of things. Mm-hmm. Because I, I was this close to graduating summa cum laude, right? I was honors college, three and a half years, right? There were just so many things. I just had a lot of natural talent, but I'm also like exceptionally disciplined and stuff. And you go from this environment where you get feedback from professors, like next class period or like the following week. And then you get into professional selling and you're not getting any feedback. Or if you do get feedback, it could be like weeks later. And so that self-doubt, that imposter syndrome really starts to set in. And it's, I'm like, doing this right? Is there something wrong with my voicemail or my email or the way I'm conducting myself on the call? Because I went in this being like, I'm so successful. Look at everything I've accomplished. And then I was like, what the heck? And it took me Mm -hmm. forever to close my first sale. And I'm like, how have they not fired me? How have Hmm. they not fired me? And I just couldn't understand why my boss was still happy and still encouraging with me because I'm like, I have not paid for myself, let alone everyone else in this organization. And it's been like months. This is horrible. And I just really started to feel inadequate and get nervous and stuff. But I really appreciated the patience that my first sales manager had with me and the encouragement because I'm also like my wiring is more big picture and like things that are more complex and like long term. Like I'll play long game all day long because sometimes I get bored with the short, quick wins. Yeah, but anybody can do that. But everyone's different. There's different types of sales roles and environments and stuff. But I just remember thinking like, oh, this is like so frustrating. And then I got to a place where there was this one company they just got done with an ERP project or they were on the tail end of an ERP. I was like, you do ERP because you want the data warehousing and the data analytics and all the operations and stuff. And so I ended up taking this. I was really emphatic with the gentleman that was running IT at the time. And I'm like, I need all the division leads together. All the division leads together. We need to understand what everyone wants to get accomplished. We need to come up with a master list. We need to prioritize it. It was probably at least nine months plus. And but then to eventually close the, that data warehouse project. And what I didn't know at the time, I was so excited. Obviously, I follow up and sending them case studies. Like, oh, well, hey, look, this is what so-and-so did and it worked. And then I remember getting so excited. All of a sudden, I get an email cool. We got the PO and here's how much. I was like, this is great. You no. Know? And so I go and I, I forward it to my sales manager, who's also the owner of the company. And he was about fell out of his chair. And then what I found out later was that at the time, that was the largest single purchase order they had ever had. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, okay. And stuff. So I, I wasn't educated enough or knowledgeable enough at the time on how long things could take. And I, sometimes I can move quick and I didn't realize what patience looked like in sales, let alone in the industry that I was in the beginning. So where did authenticity fit in or what did you think sales involved or what you had to be in sales? And then what did you learn about it? Or was it the same thing? I was always 
pretty in tune with what sales is. I am also an alum of the University of Toledo. And so one of the first graduates from the sales program back in my day, we didn't have the major. It was just the concentration slash emphasis. But even then, we were really about sales isn't selling, it's teaching someone how to buy. And so there was very much this approach on being consultative and asking good questions, talking to the right people, really trying to understand things from other people's perspective. And so that was the education that I had here at University of Toledo. But then when I went out into industry, I was really just trying to soak up as much as I could from the different consultants that were a part of the company and like understanding who our customers were and the types of solutions we've provided for them and how it's impacted their business. And I was like, I'm like, this is so cool. Like I'm increasing revenues, decreasing costs, improving productivity, maintaining compliance, decreasing waste. There were all of these different cool things that we could do with the technology and the consulting that we were selling. And so I was always just very focused on the end result. Ultimately, what metric are we going to move? Because at the end of the day, the data warehouse, the database administration, the application server, whatever, it's just a means to an end to get there. And so I've always just been more focused on talking to the people that are responsible for those particular metrics, learning more about them and what's important to them and resources that they have. Because I know there were times I'd call folks and they would try to blow me off and you need to talk to our IT manager. And I'm like, no, I actually need to talk to you. <laughs> it's, it's, because you're the one that's going to end up using this platform or this service or the data or the information. This is how you're deciding, you know, how you're planning on running your manufacturing facility. So if you don't have the data that you need, like, doesn't matter, right? Like, I need to know what your goals and priorities are, what's working, what's not working, and to what extent, and where you also see your business going. I need to have that conversation with you and more than happy to talk to. Obviously, it's going to be a tag team effort, but you need to be an active part of this conversation. So for me, it's always just came from, I just want to help. I just want to help. I'm very results oriented. And so it's, let's figure this out and, and get it done. I love it. So how do you translate that or help the future salespeople, the students that are going through your courses, understand that, especially that balance with the patients, the long game, the short game, the short results, the difficulties, and then also staying in alignment from an authentic standpoint, right? Because sometimes when people get desperate or mindset starts messing with them, they act differently. Yeah. The biggest thing we've done with our curricula and just like our approach is we've based it as much as possible, like in the real world, right? So we're very hands-on. We have role plays that the students will do. We have simulations. And then actually in some of our role plays and what we're doing in some of our classes, they're actually based with some of our corporate partners. And so it's a sales leadership case based on a real organization that we're partnered with, or we're doing an advanced sales role play, not role play, but an advanced sales selling case that's about strategic selling with customers. Of course, we've changed names and changed numbers to protect the innocent and stuff, mm -hmm. but we've grounded as much as we can in reality. And, and doing the types of um, assessments and activities that students would face in the real world in sales for them to understand this, this is the type of scenario you're going to be engaged with. So then how do you determine who the right person to talk to is going to be? And one of the things that one of my colleagues does in our advanced sales class is she's an expert in emotional intelligence. And so she does these emotional intelligence role plays with the students where they take turn playing buyer and seller. And so part of what they have to do is say, okay, you are the buyer, but this is how you're feeling, or this is what's going on in your world. And so you need to somehow project that in this role play. And then the, and then the student that plays seller, they have to figure out how this person's feeling, what's going on in their world. And so they're trying to, and so once again, they're thinking like, why are they being elusive? Or why are they being quiet? Why aren't they going into detail? And so how would I need to change how the questions I'm asking or how much I'm going to follow up or try to, you know, probe for clarification. And so we do things so that they can understand the other perspective. Part of how we've built in our major is they have to take a purchasing class to understand customer perspective. And it's a whole class on, on purchasing. So we're covering, there's legal stuff. We're also covering negotiations. We're covering strategic sourcing. We're also covering internal selling because that's the other thing that sometimes people forget about in sales is you're not just selling to the one person or the couple of people that are on the phone or the Zoom or in the meeting, there's an entire ecosystem. And that's part of what we talk about. It's not selling, it's teaching people how to buy. 
because they have to sell internally because part of what, from a customer experience perspective, and we cover this in our basic sales class, which is the first class in a seven course sequence with the major is the customer, their thought process, they go through cognitive divergent and then convergent thinking, and they spend most of their time in that cognitive thinking. First off, they have to recognize that they have a problem that they need to fix or an opportunity that they want to leverage. And then they're fleshing that out. And then they move to the divergent stage and then they converge on to look at options and then they converge on which one they want to go with. And so where do you need to spend most of your time? Where do you need to get engaged? And customer, customers have access to more information. And as we talk to our students about prospecting and things like social selling, and it's just helping them to understand that you need to get involved early, put yourself in the customer's shoes, because if you don't sell concept of change first, they're never going to change with you because they weren't sold on change in the first place. So that whole concept of change sale, that can happen to, and to some extent in parallel with the um, change with me, but you've got to get them on the concept of change first. So one thing you mentioned was the emotional intelligence side. And I just want to reiterate how important that is, because I know a lot of times when people are in sales and somebody's not responding to their messages or like you said, elusive or short on the phone or whatever it might be, not reacting as excited as the salesperson mm -hmm. is assuming everyone should be. The salesperson either takes it personal and starts getting upset or just starts making assumptions and then prejudging people. I've seen this so many times. I say, all people like this just act like this. So I don't even like calling people like this anymore or this industry or whatever this is. And I love what you said about the training that you do and just people in sales and in general, I think in life, this would help everybody. But emotional intelligence and empathy and understanding like somebody's probably going through something and the way they're reacting is more on their side than yours. And then how do you figure that out? And then how do you help them or move them forward? And I, I think that's, I think that's so important because then that's more than just, I've got this transaction, this sale to do, and I'm just going to power or bully my way through it. But let me actually get to know you. Yeah. So we also, we test them on assessing what their social style is, that they understand like, Hey, whatever your wiring is, there's nothing right or wrong about it you are who you are, but then we're also looking at what's your level of adaptability. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. there are certain things they're going to have to dial up or dial down on based on who they're interacting with or the situation mm -hmm. they could be in. And how do the students take to that, especially relative to what they thought about sales when they began? Because we do the social style and adaptability assessment in their basic sales class that they'll take as juniors. And so for a lot of them, there are some students, they'll take basic sales because they're already committed to the sales program. And that's what they want to do. Sometimes we get a marketing student that's just taking this as an elective. And then there's other students, they'll just, you know, take it as an elective too. But we also have like minors in the program too. But when they go through that basic sales class, because there's a lot of like sales concept, foundational things, but then we also walk them through like sales process 101. And there's lots of role playing in that class. And for some of them, they realize that they, it's like invigorating. They're like, yes, this is exactly where I need to be. Like they understand, they're excited that they are recognizing that sales has a science and an art to it. Because like we teach the students, look, this is a framework, right? Like we're not telling you there are no magic words. Because that's like sometimes the students are just like, they'll sit there, like they'll watch like sample role plays. And then there's kind of, oh, can you rewind it? Or they'll go to like our online role play channel and like replay you know, sales calls and stuff. And I'm like, I love the fact that you're doing some background research, but understand this is a framework. You use this, there's no magic words. I mean, we, they do need to pay attention to sequencing and there are some things, how they phrase things. That's important as well too. But it's usually that class for most of the students is quite invigorating for them because they feel really validated and like they're in the right spot. There are some students, it can be a bit of a shift for them because maybe they thought things in sales were a little bit different. But usually the biggest surprise, if you will, for some of the students is they start to realize how much work sales is because we start to break it down in terms of like we do all of these exercises to get them ready for their role play. And at the end of the day, every single little exercise, that's little five points here, five points there, but it all plugs into their sales call guide. And so then when they start to realize like, I, why am I having to come up with identifying we do this exercise, we have to identify like key pieces of missing information. And we tell them up front, like this exercise is probably going to make you mad. And that's good because you're going to realize all the things you don't know. 
And what we want you to do is channel that whole, I don't know, crap. We want you to channel that in and then prioritize it so you can come up with an agenda on like where and how you want to focus your questioning during your 15 minute, you know, role play. And so they start to realize, God, I got to know this. I got to know that. I got to be really mindful of how I'm, how I'm managing my time. Because if I don't focus on the key pieces of information, because they do an information gathering role play, and then later on in the same semester, they do a proposal presentation role play based on the needs they uncovered in that role play, but also based on the RFP, the request for proposal that the purchasing student sent them. And so they're like, okay, cool. I got the RFP. I had my information gathering role play. Now I'm going to pr- make a proposal and present a proposal. And then the purchasing students write a purchase recommendation after all of that to say who gets the business. Because the purchasing students are also hearing from multiple sales students. So the students are literally competing for the business. And so the students realize, oh my God, like they'll get done with their role play. I'm like, oh my God, that went so fast. I never even got to these other things. And then we make them do a self-assessment. They have to do a self-assessment. There's peer critiques. We also do corporate coaching sessions where our corporate partners watch role plays, go John Madden on it, give them feedback. And then the students in leadership class also do peer critiques. And the students, like they sit there and they're just like, oh my God, I just left that implicit need. I did nothing with it. Or I didn't finish my spin cycle. Or in other cases, they're sitting there thinking like, I did not fully handle that objection. Oh my God, I completely left the last stage there. And so they start to realize how important it is to be very mindful of what they're doing and then recognizing that some of the stuff that might make them feel a little uncomfortable, probing for clarification when they're asking questions or properly handling an objection, they start to realize that it's actually, that's part of how they can be more authentic is you just don't want to like gloss over the fact that somebody was not trying to answer a question or they only gave you like half the answer or they just gave you like a one word answer. Let's talk about that because they're hesitating because they have a basic issue. So let's peel that back. And there's different ways you can ask the questions where it doesn't, where it seems, not seems, but it is, it's more conversational and sincere as opposed to being like, why are you saying no? What's your problem? There's ways to phrase things. And there's also like with the way you can ask your questions and then tee up and even open up a call to help with that. So they start to realize just how many moving parts there are and how much work it can be. And so for some of them, they're like, oh, this is so much more than I thought. And then, and some that thought that sales was going to be this like easy peasy, like, I'm just a good talker. I'm great with people. You do need to be good with people, but you also need to be really good with yourself. (laughs) It is so true because there's that group that, oh, I'm just good at talking people, talking to people and talking my way into or out of situations. And so it should be easy. And again, I love that you brought up that balance of uh, art and science and the framework and then all the stuff that goes into it, which got me really excited for part two when we start talking about sales processes, because we're starting to touch on that. And there's a bunch of things I want to bring up when it comes to that. I also just want to say, I love the fact that you have a purchasing class and then you have obviously the sales classes and then you have the purchasing class interacting with the sales people on both sides of the fence. So they're learning how to see it from that side. Because I think that's one of the best things, like they always, like I've always thought the best salespeople are also someone who's a customer or has bought that product or service or used it or been in a company that's used it because you get it from the other side Mm -hmm. and you understand it. And now you can speak to it from that side, but you also know what's important and what's not important. And so I, I love that fact that you're teaching people how it's feels from the buyer side and how it goes and what they have to understand because then they're more empathetic when they start selling because they're like oh yeah that's right i'm just not selling this person it's up to them Mm -hmm. there's going to be other stakeholders involved talk about that in the process stuff i know we're going to dive into that for people who want to find out more and the links will be in the show notes your website which is nice and easy i appreciate that which is sales.utoledo dot edu and so that yep. will be in the show notes and then also people want to connect with you on linkedin just like i do with everybody deirdre jones on linkedin they can find you and again it'll be in the show notes yep. deirdre thanks for being here and sharing so much in this first episode i'm super excited for what we're going to cover in the remaining two parts so thank you for being here and for everyone tuning in thank you for being here make sure to join us in part two we're going to talk about sales process i already have a bunch of things i'm going to bring up we're just scratching the surface and i appreciate you being here everyone who's tuning in watching listening however you found this and thank you for helping fill the world with authentic persuaders